Okay, so tonight we're going to learn about cover crops in the home garden. Uh, and this is a, a little bit different. So you might be used to cover crops uh, in the farm. You might have heard farmers talk about cover crops and a lot of the concepts are the same, but we do deal with them a little bit differently. So we're going to uh, talk how they're, how they're different and how we use them in the home garden. So we think about the winter in our garden or maybe a dormant season, maybe even summer. What do you think is the best for the soil and for soil microorganisms and for nutrients? If we have a nice lush vegetative plant life or if we have bare soil? Well, the answer is really the, the vegetative life. There's lots of things that uh, bare soil does in our garden that isn't necessarily good. Now, it sometimes depends on who you ask. So if you're talking to Jody or another entomologist, they might say that bare soil in the, in the garden or landscape is good because it is habitat for ground nesting insects. If we cover it with a mulch or something like that, uh, we can inhibit those ground nesting insects that could be good insects. Uh, but we're gonna talk a little bit at the end about how maybe cover crops can help with that and still maintain the overall health of our soil. So why are cover crops a good idea? Well, they can reduce soil erosion. So imagine we have this big open garden, maybe it's even just a four by eight bed, and we have this nude soil, there's nothing covering it, and the rain comes along, the snow comes along, we get a lot of precipitation and it washes soil away. So it can happen on a large farm field, it can happen in your small garden. So what we wanna do is to reduce that erosion by providing some sort of cover. We add biomass into the actual soil, which improves soil structure. So those roots grow down in there uh, and they sort of break down after we've killed off or removed the residue of the cover crop and that builds matter in the soil. There are different kinds of cover crops that we can use and one of them is a legume. So those are like peas and beans and things like that. And all of them add nutrients, but legumes are great at adding nitrogen because they have bacteria that live on their roots that turn nitrogen in the atmosphere into nitrogen in the soil. And so we can actually add a lot of nitrogen into the soil by using those um, legumes in the soil. We can also improve microbiotic activity. So having those roots, roots of plants actually exude different chemicals into the soil that attract different good bacteria and fungi. So the more roots we have, and then they break down, and then we have all those like decomposing bacteria and fungi that are also good for the soil, we have all of that going on. Uh, weed reduction, so we can actually smother out weeds um, you know, if you have an open soil, all those weed seeds can land and they can sprout. If we keep it covered, we can keep some of that uh, at bay. We suppress diseases. Um, so if we're, if we're doing the cover crops and we um, are leaving the residue, say we cut the cover crop and we put it in place or we leave the stems, we're actually creating a mulch and we'll talk about that in a bit. We're going to capture leftover fertilizer. So if we've added fertility into our soil, if we have the bare soil, when it rains on there, all the, the fertility uh, may wash out. Uh, we can reduce evaporation of soil moisture, reduce soil temperature fluctuations, and as we're going to talk about at the end, uh, provide habitat for beneficial insects. So there are a few negatives of cover crops that we have to think about. Uh, they can keep soil cool and wet later in the spring. Uh, because we do have it protected from the, the sun that comes in onto the soil. We have some that are hard to kill. So some of these are perennials. Some of them are easy to kill perennials. Some of them are harder to kill perennials. And we probably want to focus on the easy to kill perennials because if it grows and competes with our vegetables or our fruits, then it actually becomes a weed. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the traditional way to do cover crops was to cut it down or kill it and then till it into the soil as a green manure. Uh, and a lot of farmers do that. And what happens is, is that's breaking down the bacteria and fungi in the soil, pull the nitrogen out of the soil to break down that material. 
so there are some alternate ways that we can think about. And plus, we can't really be, you know, tilling in a lot of stuff into our home gardens a lot of time. We're also talking about reducing tilling, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, and sometimes, uh, if we have some of those fields, we'll have that excess, excessive spring growth. So it's hard to get some control on some of them. And we'll talk about uh, how to select cover crops in a bit. So here are some common species uh, that you might find, you might see. And it really depends on when you want to do like a, a fallow period in your garden. So we're thinking about um, how we're doing a cropping system. So we can do um, like a summer crop. If I'm growing tomatoes, I might want uh, a cover crop for the cool season to either start off in the spring or to have in the, the fall and winter. And so we would pick a cool season crop that we could plant uh, either fall and let it overwinter, or we could even sneak two of them in uh, and do a winter and a spring different one, depending on what we wanted to do. Or let's say I'm doing cool season crops. I'm growing maybe lettuce in the spring and I wanted to, that plot to have a break in the summer and I want to do broccoli in the fall. I can actually sneak in a warm season cover crop, uh, something like buckwheat, or even um, we think of them, so a farmer would call this the cash crop. Like a farmer grows soybeans as a crash, cash crop. The soybeans is also uh, a cover crop because it provides that benefit into the soil. So you sometimes can harvest a cover crop like green beans. Green beans or peas could be a cover crop. You would harvest um, the beans or the peas off of it, and then you would cut the plant down, use as a mulch or incorporate into the soil. And so these are the common um, uh, species that we will see for, for cover crops, especially for home gardens. And so we see like, in the cool season, the rye and the wheats and the oats, um, annual ryegrass. So what you want to do is pick something, you know, a lot of home gardeners, at least their first few times around, they'll want to pick something that kills off in the winter so you don't have to worry about killing it in the spring. So maybe an annual ryegrass, radishes, um, some of those things that aren't a winter. So winter wheat or a winter rye will survive the winter and it'll come back in spring. And you'll have to figure out how to terminate that. And we'll ter talk about terminating cover crops in a bit. Uh, so there's some different things you can uh, do to help pick uh, the best cover crop. Uh, and I found this little uh, tool online and I'm gonna do a quick demo with it. So this is from the Midwest Cover Crop Council. Uh, and this is a new version of the tool. I found the old one. And then when I went back, it's like, oh, well, this isn't the right place anymore. It's different. Uh, but uh, we will do a little demonstration of this tool. Uh, let me make sure, here we go. So here we are, this is live. Uh, let me close out all the other tabs here. We don't need to get confused. So uh, this tool uh, can be used and we, you might think, well, this is for farmers, but it's not just for farmers. Um, so it says farm, but there's um, also vegetables and stuff on here. So we're gonna pick Nebraska. We're gonna select a county. And why does the county matter? That will put us in the right zone to know when to plant things. This is gonna tell us when to plant things. So we're talking about vegetable gardening here. We wanna talk about the current cash crop. What is the cash crop? And we want something, we're growing warm season vegetables. So we want, um, to have this as our cash crop. We're not selling it maybe for our home garden, but it, we're, we're growing it as a crop. Uh, and you can pick different goals. So you can do interseeding, so you don't have to wait to plant. You can plant it while your tomatoes are still growing. You wanna add nitrogen. Um, you want it to survive the winter. There's long, lots of, of different goals you can have here. I wanna see all my options. So I'm not gonna select a goal. Uh, and I'm going to click find the cover crops. And here's a handy little chart that has a nice list of all the cover crops uh, that I could grow. And then the chart here is so the green means that it's acceptable to plant. Yellow means I could possibly plant, but there's a risk of freezing or dying out. 
So uh, if we look, we're in the middle of September. So we have anything that's in green in the middle of this box right here. So we could still plant some clovers. We could do winter barley. Remember I told you, if you do a, a winter barley, winter wheat, um, it will sur probably survive the winter and you will have to terminate it in the spring. To make sure it doesn't come back. Uh, and then we keep going down this list. You know, there's mustard, greens, oats, peas, uh, rye, ryegrass, you know, all these different things we could still plant uh, in our garden as a cover crop. Uh, and if you, um, you know, if you take a look, you know, so maybe, so I'm in Douglas County, I'm in Omaha, we have, let's look at Hall County right here. So that should, basically it just shifted the green and yellow boxes a little bit. So we have those different dates. So you can use this tool. I will provide the link in the resources at the end uh, so you can get uh, to that tool. But that is the best thing that I can suggest to help select a cover crop. The nice thing is that over here where it tells you, you can actually click on the link and it will take you uh, to information about that cover crop planting information, termination information. Some of this, this is the new version, so some of this isn't filled out, uh, but it hopefully will be very soon. So I haven't been monitoring the questions. Do we have any questions um, so far? We're good. Okay. I'm trying to make sure I get back to the right screen. I think there we go. So how do we establish a cover crop? We want to sow at the correct time. We just learned that from the chart. Um, sometimes we can still sow them in the, the, the garden, even while we still have our cash crop, our veggies in the garden. And that's the case like, you know, you might not want to, if your tomatoes are doing great, you don't want to dig them out and plant a cover crop. Uh, so you can, can enter sow around the tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, whatever you've got going in the garden. You can sow by hand or spreader, but you want to make sure you have good soil contact. Uh, you want to make sure that you know, all the seed gets down and touches the soil. Um, you also might need to rake it in or do some sort of cover. Like if you've ever seeded a lawn, uh, you, know, you want to have the soil slightly disturbed to make sure it's covered. And then you have to keep it well watered until it's established because if it gets wet and then dries out, you've killed your seeds. So terminating cover crops. So those that don't die automatically, like if you did an annual ryegrass, it would die over the winter. Um, but if you did a perennial ryegrass, it's not going to die. So what you would have to do is to cut or break it to terminate it. You have to, to kill the plant. Uh, and you can use a weed whacker or a grass whip. And if you don't know what a grass whip is, I have a picture on the next screen uh, to mow it down. Or you can make a homemade contraption with a board and a rope. I will show you that, uh, where you step on it to break it. You can choose to leave the residue in place as a mulch or to remove and compost. So what we wanna really do is encourage no-till or low-till gardening. So you can actually leave uh, this in place as a mulch. You don't have to remove any of it. You could remove the, the part that you cut off or break off uh, and put it in the compost and then bring it back to the garden uh, as finished compost. You wanna, you know, you're, you're using the, the organic matter from the, the garden and the nutrients to create this organic matter. So you wanna incorporate it back in. If possible, you leave the roots and the, the bottom of the stems in place for soil structure uh, and as a mulch, so that's for no-till. And you wanna make sure that you terminate at the right time to reduce chances of survival. If you wait too long, uh, those, those perennials can survive uh, and you wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. So here are some things. So the, on the left, we have, that's a grass whip. Uh, basically you just go along and you can sort of, uh, it's like a, a, a mini scythe. So if you have a scythe, you can use that uh, or you can use this grass whip or here's a, a, a cover crop terminator um, made of a board. So they've just got a rope uh, tied around each end of the board or they're just using a board. Rope is usually easier because then you pick it up. Then you go along and you just stomp down and you want to make sure that um, the base of the stems are broken. So they will leave this in place as a mulch. 
uh, and then they will plant right into that whatever they're getting ready to plant. Uh, and so you can use that as a mulch. So just a shout out, a quick advertisement for uh, no-till gardening. A lot of people, they love to till up that soil, but it actually um, reduces your production uh, in gardening and reduces the good bacteria and microorganisms and insects and worms and all those things uh, and creates a lot of runoff. Uh, so we're really encouraging you to try to reduce tillage or do no tillage uh, and cover crops can help with that because you can grow them in and all those roots go down into that soil and create all these good aggregates on all of this good soil structure. And if you till it up, you're actually destroying a lot of uh, the good stuff that you're creating. So some resources to share with you. Uh, Nebraska Crop Watch, so Extension has a cover crop page and you will get the notes. We'll put that on the website as we share the recording as well. Uh, so that's uh, cropwatch.unl.edu slash cover crops. Um, uh, one of the best extension documents I've found about growing cover crops uh, came from Washington State University. Uh, and so I put that in there. It's not ours, but it was a great guide uh, for cover crops for the home garden. Uh, and then the, that uh, cover crop decision tool that I used, there's the link to that. So you'll get these links uh, as well. And one of the benefits I sort of uh, mentioned is that cover crops uh, is for uh, pollinators and beneficial insects. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jody, and she's going to talk about uh, insects and cover crops. Do you have those slides on there or not? Oh, I don't, but I can. Oh, well, I didn't know I was going to be part of this presentation, actually. Well, we can wait for that. That's fine. Oh, no, we can put it in. Um, there we go. I just need to share. Yeah, well, I, I, John had said something about pollinators, and so I added a couple slides in. I didn't know I was going to get to say a few words. But with cover crops, the pollinators that you can attract is going to be numerous depending on what you choose. And I found the article that John sent me really helpful um, because they have a lot of the different types of cover crops that you can have there, that which include the perennials or other vegetables and uh, grasses. And a lot of times these will, will definitely help to have the pollinators there while they're either helping with you know pollinate your squash plants but we also i wanted to say that most of the time people think about honeybees and when i think about pollinators and i've done a lot of different pollinator education programs recently because there is a really big interest in growing uh, concern about pollinators that are more than just honeybees so I talk about a lot of the native bees and that those do include bumblebees and in Nebraska we have 20 different types of bumblebees and right now, especially if you're growing, uh, if you've got sedum or anything in your garden, we've got a lot of those bumblebees out there. Um, they're kind of cute in the morning because they're cold and you can see them sleeping and, and pet them. But we've got a lot of pollinating beetles that you may see, those soldier, sol soldier beetles there. Um, in the middle on that sedum. They are, a lot of times people think they're wasps, but they are pollinating beetles. In the spring, we've got a type of soldier beetle like that, so the margin leatherwing. And in the fall, we have the goldenrod leatherwing. So that's what that one is. But we also have a lot of those native bees that are small, that are ground nesting bees, or ones that will nest in cavities. And a lot of times my programs talk about different, um, you know, little, holes in, in wood blocks or using reeds or things that you find um, the stems that you may cut down and save or you know keep keep
keep up in the garden. We've also got some wasps, some daytime moths that you may see, butterflies, and again, um, actually a lot of flies that pollinate. So those little things that we call hoverflies, those are a type of pollinator and many flies. Flies are actually the second best pollinator after bees. Um, another thing we may want to think about are increasing those plants and using those cover crops to not only attract but protect some beneficial insects. And you know, for people that aren't really into bugs, they may not think about insects as being beneficial, but we've got some here and they're beneficial because they're predators of some of our pest species. And this slide are, include kind of a lot of carnage, but these are our general predators that we have in our garden that are, are pretty helpful. So, um, and these are all pictures that I've taken, you know, around the Hope Garden, around the Extension Office, and any time I get to be outside. But these are definitely going to be helpful. Um, you can see that wheel bug with the Japanese beetle, um, you know, one of our big enemies. So these things, including assassin bugs, the lady beetles, you know, all of those things, they're going to be helpful. And so to have bare soil, you're not going to be really attracting these things or protecting them. And, um, you know, if you've got those cover crops, that can also include these predators. And then lastly, we've got specialist predators. So if you guys are all growing tomatoes, I'm sure you've had some hornworms um, come and take a little bite or two. Um, and, you know, they do have their enemy and they get they get a really sad ending as well. So there are there is basically a parasitoid or a predator for pretty much a lot of many insects. Um, but these are very highly specialized uh, wasps that prey only on that species. And so from these pictures, you can see um, the, the top left, those are the little tiny wasps and they're um, that's what comes out of those cocoons that are on that uh, hornworm. And then we've got other ones that turn aphids into mummies and, you know, turn a lot of different caterpillars into mush. So these are things that are helpful in the garden and something that cover crops can provide that you probably never thought of. Thank you, Jody, for providing some beauty, some information, and some carnage uh, for, her, for the talk. Uh, and so I'm just going to finish up with a few more resources here. Let me make sure I have the right share. There we go. So there's that guy that I was talking about. Uh, it is from SARE, so SARE.org. Uh, and uh, I'll provide the link for that uh, as well. Um, also, we often think about, okay, well, I can get my seeds from the garden center um, or I can order them. And sometimes that's the case. Like sometimes garden centers will have these, sometimes not. And we actually have several companies that grow and distribute uh, cover crop seeds here in Nebraska. Uh, and so here are three local seed companies that I found that um, sell quantities for home gardeners. There are a few others, but I don't think most home gardeners need like 50 pounds of of you know rye seed for your garden, uh, and so uh, you can find uh, smaller uh, quantities at these stock seed company, Green Cover Seed and Green Acres Cover Crops. And I know there's more; those are the three that I found uh, the quickest. You can also order them some of the seed catalogs, like Johnny's. Uh, some of those garden, um, like more for growers, will have cover crops that you can order, um, and you can order from these companies. Uh, and have it delivered, or some of them will even do pickup. Like it might be a little trip out of town to go pick them up, um, but you can do that as well. Uh, so you can keep in touch with me on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, all those different places, email. Um, and next week, so I, I got through that quickly. Um, next week we're doing composting. So be sure to join us on September 22nd uh, for composting. Uh, and after that, it's putting your garden to bed, and uh, Jody will be back and talking about insects and overwintering insects as well, uh, as I think Terry and Elizabeth are talking about what you do in your garden to put it to bed. Uh, so those will be all interesting and exciting things. Mm -hmm.